and he went to morning. This next two weeks, we're going to be going through the book of Job. This week, chapters 1 through 21. The next week, chapters 2 through 42. We're going to ask some of the tough questions of life. And the way we're going to do that is with an interview both weeks with a guy named Mitch McVicker. I met Mitch a couple weeks ago. One of our small groups here at the Vineyard Longmont hosted a concert in a barn. <laughs> And Mitch came and sang some songs and it was awesome. Mitch was good friends, probably best friends, with a guy named Rich Mullins. You may have heard of him. A uh, contemporary Christian musician, wrote and recorded a bunch of stuff in the 90s and in the 80s. Our God is an awesome God. My Deliverer is coming. Mitch actually co wrote that song with him. They were good friends and roommates for the last three years of Rich Mullins' life. In fact, Mitch was in the Jeep on the border between Arizona and New Mexico when the Jeep crashed and Rich Mullins was killed. This was in 1997. And Mitch was nearly killed, was in a coma for quite some time. Spent a year or two rehabbing from that accident and having to learn how to walk all over again. So we're gonna talk about the book of Job. Questions like, why does God allow suffering? What role does the devil play in our suffering? How do we make sense of it? And what is God teaching us through it? We'll talk about these things and several others as we find out about Mitch's life, find out a little bit about New Mexico, about the Navajos, and what life is all about. I really enjoyed this interview. I hope you will too. So I'm talking to uh, Mitch, who I just barely met. I met I met you uh, technically at your uh, at your uh, 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 merchandise table. Oh, and I meant to wear my T-shirt, which is <laughs> sitting in the room. So uh, you were in a hurry to take my money. Uh, I was still dressed. I was still dressed in my work clothes because I had come straight from remodeling my basement. Really enjoyed the concert. I did want to ask you, uh, one of the songs that Spotify said was one of your top five was your New Mexico song. Um, yeah. I'm assuming you wrote that in New Mexico. Yeah. Kind of a stretch. Uh, that's, a, that's a song that, um, that my friend Rich Mullins and I, we co-wrote when we were living out in New Mexico and we were each... Um, thinking of a friend that we hadn't stayed in very good contact with or rekindle that relationship saying, you know what, even though we haven't done a very good job of staying in contact, uh, you're still, you're still uh, close to me. You're dear to my heart. And um, that's really what this, the song was about. And, 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 and it references living in, living in the desert. And, and uh, I'm a big New Mexico fan. I, I when I got yeah. out of church work, I, I got burned out and got out of church work for seven years and did a bunch of publishing uh, advertising stuff in new mexico so i drove all over that state and yeah uh, but were you guys, it, but i know you're near an indian reservation were you over in gallup n near the uh, Navajos? Yeah, near, yeah just west of gallup basically on the border um window rock arizona was the incorporated town um yeah the navajo reservation um and yeah just everywhere you go you can see the 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 way the earth has has fluctuated and moved over the yeah. over the many years and, and it's and it's really moving a great um, great place to live just the vastness right. vacantness and, yeah. and and it really really spoke to me as far as i mean uh being in tune with um god was it was uh much more in front of me gosh it's yeah. it's much it's much um more uh readily available for me to pay attention to um the the way the the, the spirit moves yeah interesting i grew up in flagstaff so whenever i oh, go beautiful. yeah whenever i go on i-40 right at the border and you got the you got the roll the the cliffs the, the rounded uh sandstone cliffs uh, which of course is right near gallup yeah uh, there's something there's something very emotional for me it's funny i, I know the navajos uh, can, their boundary was sort of four mountains they considered them yeah. four holy mountains uh yeah the four yeah, yeah, for Sacred Mountains, if Flagstaff is at the foot of the San Francisco peaks, which was San Francisco the peaks. South, southwest yeah. terminus of the Sacred Mountains. And I grew up uh, at the foot of a bluff, a little lava bubble uh, in East Flagstaff called Mount Eldon. And we play in the woods when I was a kid with my buddies, uh, picking up horn toads, which apparently don't exist anymore. The whole Southwest is in the 60s when I grew up had little, we called them horny toads uh, yeah. all over the place. And, and apparently, I don't know if it's because, you know, what's happened, but um anyway that that little bluff i lived at the foot of 
was was sacred to me. And yeah. um, Lewis, C.S. Lewis talks about numinous experiences and how that's like a, a, a step toward the pre- realizing the presence of God. And for me, when I, anytime I'm in Flagstaff, I, I get this uh, odd sense of melancholy fear and, uh, and fear is the right word. Um, I hurt, I hurt on the inside. And, uh, this is stuff I don't normally share with people who aren't, aren't artists. I'm waiting for you to roll your eyes, but I, I have a weird <laughs> feeling. I have a weird feeling you might get it. Um, just because of what you said about the Navajo. The vastness, the vacantness, um, causes us to, to, uh, look inward and, 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 and look at how our inwardness relates to, all of that around us. Yeah, the, the horny toads speak. They speak to you and I. And um, it, it's, 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 it hurts me too that they're gone. The Hogans, um, that was part of our, uh, uh, part of our uh, existence when we lived out there was to build those eight, eight sided uh, traditional Navajo dwellings. And, um, and so we did a lot of that stuff in the, in the, in the winter and so the trashes would love to come out and hang out with us and they, <laughs> they would move so slowly that it was like you could pet them you yeah. know because it was cold yeah and the, and the, in the summer the, the horny toes are hopping all around but um okay. yeah, yeah. I, I love that stuff and, and hearing the coyotes every night you would fall asleep to hearing the coyotes yelp and yeah it sounded like they were murdering you but but they were yeah. just yelping and it was beautiful yeah uh, so it was a different existence for sure. I was wondering if you were with uh, with Rich during that time, and um, how long were you guys living in that uh, place right on the border of the two states? There, Al- almost three years. Almost okay, a long time. No, so not that long, and then the wreck happened, and and that ended that. And I'm alive and I'm living in a place where the crust has shifted and the stars in the milky way they're giving a party for new mexico yes i've come to the desert just to find my way to forever and you are so desert fathers and the desert mothers and uh how uh, it seems like when there's desolation uh you're more apt to hear from god and of course uh those first guys uh like i think saint anthony was one of the first desert fathers and he was out in egypt so they left this he left the city and and then everybody started leaving because the, the church got more commercialized when it became legal yeah. in the 300 yeah. we do a kind of a quest every week uh, at least my wife and i do we're trying to get the church to do it but um Last week, the quest was just pick a day for prayer and fasting. And to me, uh, hearing from God in the desert is sort of like a fast. You, you have less resources. And so you yeah. see God or something weird like that. But, yeah. Well, tell me about yourself. My, my mom would make me sing in church, do special music every now and again. And I got tired of doing songs from books. So I started making up my own. I played basketball in high school and in that led to a scholarship in college, and and um, and that's what took me to Friends University in Wichita, Kansas. Um, that's where I met Rich, um, and we became friends and started hanging out. And uh, then he realized that I could play the guitar, and I had been making up songs. And um, that's kind of how we natural connection there huh did, I, did you I, attend any of james brian smith's classes i've read a bunch of his books uh, yeah good and beautiful god good and, is that that whole series <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's ironic because i just got off the phone with jim and um he he uh he was my chaplain he was my advisor he i was in probably four or five different classes of his i was mm-hmm. always over at his house because rich rich lived in his attic and I was always over at Jim's house. And um, uh, yeah, those, those two guys um, uh, probably uh, formed more of my approach to life than, 
than most most people have. It was, it was founded by the the Quaker Church, which yeah. Friends, Friends Church is synonymous with Quaker Church. And the um, vineyard and, that I'm a part of came from John Wimber was a Friends was a Quaker pastor in Southern California. So oh, okay. the vineyard is half Quaker, half Calvary Chapel, half charismatic or something like that. Yeah, nice. That's that's three halves. That's well, but you're an art. You're a musician. It's okay to uh, <laughs> okay to not have good math, right? <laughs> so I I we went to campus fellowship that was led half the time by Jim led half the time by Rich hmm. and um and just they they, they were my, that's who I hung out with so Rich asked me what I was going to do and, and I had no idea and he said why don't you work with me and that's what after the day after graduation we moved out to Window Rock right on the wow. Arizona border and um and that's how I ended up ended ended up in the music world um uh, because he was doing concerts and I ended up pl- strumming along on the guitar, singing harmonies with him. And um, and eventually, you know, because I was making up songs, he eventually let me do some some of my own songs in his concerts. And um, and that went on, you know, that went on for a while. And, and you could kind of see the trajectory of where things were going. And then the wreck happened and, and um, my life flipped around, got turned inside out, and I didn't know what the hell was happening. Um, but but you just keep uh, uh, putting putting your feet down one foot in front of the other with, with the, you know, whatever, whatever condition your feet are in. Yeah, are you a, a different person now? Like your parents say that your personality has changed since from before the accident to after. Like, are you yeah. a different person because of that? Uh, they would they would say that to a degree, definitely. Um, and 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 the whole experience happened at an odd time. It happened in my early twenties, which who isn't changing in their early twenties? You know, who isn't a different person when they're thirty than when they were eighteen? Uh, I am now forty eight. So the- I mean, you are crazy old, crazy. crazy. <laughs> so I mean, you're allowed to tell somebody that if you're older than they are. You know, <laughs> kind of like you can make fun of your own ethnicity if you're if you're if that's your culture or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I think I think I'm different in a num- in a number of ways. Um, I don't know if if the wreck is is the um, is the general culprit of that, or if if just like I said the the crucible of being in that uh, early twenties time. You know, people people ask me. You know, it's it's been whatever. How many years have you have you rectified it? How have you you know what conclusions have you come to? What kind of answers have you arrived at? I'm like none. Yeah. Zero. Zero. To me, um, uh, Jesus isn't the answer. Jesus is the question, and Jesus moves us um, to to this openness to this trust of things not having to make sense. Um, and, and, and so I go, gosh, you know, people talk about the faithfulness of God and they say, um, God was sure faithful in bringing you through that wreck. And I go, well, you know, shut up because the, when you say something like that, are, are you not insinuating that the faithfulness of God was not there for, for someone that didn't come through the wreck? And like your friend. Did, didn't, or someone who didn't come through something. Right. Wreck. And we know that's not the case. Um, the faithfulness of God is. And um, uh, that may not be something that we can detect at every corner of our, of our lives, but do our detections, do our perceptions our notions, our assumptions, do they change? They have no bearing on the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God okay. is, yes. and, and it may not, it may not be how we think it ought to be. The faithfulness of God, the grace of God that's been slavished upon us. We are just trying to stand there and be uh, drenched in, clothed in, undergirded by all of it. Mm-hmm. Dallas Willard talks about the 23rd Psalm and uh, Life Without Lack, a book he had. And he, he says that you have to uh, accept, that you really should accept that you're in God's tender care always, uh, including even if you're killed, that that's not 
like, dang, I guess we fell out of God's care, but that, and that the, the care is bigger than even our own lives. And, yeah. uh, and that we should, uh, that we have the opportunity to live in a place of trust and comfort, uh, whether, even if we, even if we do die kind of thing. Right. Is that, is that the worst thing you ever went through? Yeah. Or? A, a number of years I went through a divorce and, and that, that was, that was hard, just the alteration of life and the, um, not being around my, my kids in a present situation, um, yeah. as, as much as I once was. Um, but I, but I've become through that and, and my kids have become through that. I've learned, you know, that, um, it, the, 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 the quantity time isn't as important as quality time. And, um, mm -hmm. and that, that was a, a a, a rough teacher that, that caused me to, um, to, really trust and trust more than I ever had um, mm -hmm. to go, you know what, I, I can't be there um, for, for um, Brooklyn's every move. I can't be there for Payson's every move, but, um, but I, I'm going to trust that they're going to become through this. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I, and I know, I know that we, that we will have a great relationship through it. So that's been, a, that's been another, um, growing um uh sharp thing i'm going to quote from the book of job and um this text is so i don't know some people say job is literal it actually happened uh i whenever i read it i'm like there's no way this is a metaphor this is intended yeah. to make a point and maybe that makes me an evil liberal christian or something but um but uh the beginning of this book it just seems so flippant like we're talking about our lives here and there's just like this, this conversation between God and Satan that just seems so uh, like they're like they're having a little competition with each other and, and really shallow. And, and we're the, the, the chess pawns in the game. And, yeah. and we know that that's not who God is. And of course, this book is actually all about who God is. That seems to be the, the theme. At least that's what everyone's arguing about in this book. But I'm going to read it and then uh, maybe we can talk about it or just get your thoughts on it. Uh, yeah. So I'm in chapter one, one day the angels came through 12. to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Uh, Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Uh, and I think that is like, that seems to be the big theme throughout. Is, is Job going to curse God? Is he going to blame and God? The Lord said to Satan, very well, then everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And uh, the story progresses, and eventually God lets him lay a hand on the man himself, too. Just can't kill him. Explain this to us, Mitch. We're all wondering <laughs> what this means. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's that's hard because I, I'm with you. I go, I go, it is a, to me, it's a metaphor. Um, and um, I don't know that. I mean, the, the God that I know doesn't turn us over to the devil's actions. The, the, the God that I know um, is always calling us to God's self. And we are causing it. We're often the, this cause. But yeah, yeah, this is, then there are times when crap just happens to us. I know, I know, and um, and we. I think I think it comes from our uh, uh, lust for um, things to always make sense um, in order mm -hmm. for us to keep going. And I I don't know. I mean, the, to me, this book is is just a it's a reflection of of just that. If I were Job, I would, I would, I would feel 
beyond awful. Like, uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I really dislike his friends. I really dislike his friends. Um, I just go. What's well, funny about his friends is is that they're mean to him, and uh, and then and then they're all they finally they're like windbags. They finally run out of air, and yeah. then some young guy, young guy comes at the end. He says, "You guys are old. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm young. <laughs> Even though I'm young, lay off. I know what I'm talking about." And then he he seems to pretty much say the same stuff that the other guy said. He just says it a little more forcefully. He, he goes into <laughs> nature. He goes into nature saying, look, nature, basically, look how cool nature is. It proves that God is just and you're not. And um, if, if this is a metaphor about the human condition, because, I mean, I, I think I think a really good question is, is it's the, the problem of pain. If, there's a, if, if God is a loving God and he's all powerful, then why is this stuff happening to us? And is it our fault? Yeah. And is God to be trusted despite that? Right. When you, when you think about, um, I, I'm sure this is an unanswerable question, but um, when you and Rich were, uh, you guys were driving in a Jeep or what kind of, what kind of car was it? Um, yeah, when, it was a Jeep, yeah. When that Jeep crashed, uh, was evil... Do you think demons or the devil were looking for an opportunity to kill you guys? And, and is that what happened? Mm -hmm.